This video is going to give you a concrete example of how clustering and principal component analysis that we covered in last week's lectures can be applied to understand data that comes from a particular example where we want to be able to classify actions uh, based on some observations that we've taken. So this is uh, going to be an example where we're using the data from that's collected using a Samsung Galaxy S3. So this is a smartphone and inside the smartphone there's an accelerometer. The accelerometer is used so that when you turn the camera on its side it can change the orientation of the video and that's a pretty cool feature but we're actually going to be using the data for something else when we do this analysis. So that accelerometer actually measures um, how much activity is going on in, on three different axes and so a study was performed where that data was collected um, for a number of individuals and each individual participated in uh, several different types of activities. And during those activities, they had the smartphone in their pocket and the accelerometer measured the types of activity that were going on. So this data is available from the UCI Machine Learning Repository, and I've given you the URL here for the uh, data. It actually comes in several different files, and I've done just some light processing to create a, a slightly more processed version of the data set, which is um, easier to distribute. So that uh, data set is available from this URL, which you can see here. And uh, I've also made the data set available from the course website. So the first thing that I do is I download the file and I load it into R. And so if I look at the names of the variables in this data set, you can see that they are all measures of acceleration. And these measures of acceleration um, are actually summarized over a, a period of time. And so you see that the summary statistic is given for each measurement, either it's a mean over a period of time or a standard deviation or a median absolute deviation and then you can see which axis the measurement is being taken on whether it's the x-axis or the y-axis or the z-axis. In the data set we also have a variable called activity and that variable tells you what the, the subject was doing while they were um, participating in the study. So they could be laying, sitting, standing, walking or walking up and down stairs. And so you can see that the activities are sort of equally distributed across these different uh, types of activities. And so what we're going to be trying to do in this analysis is use these measurements that were collected with the Samsung Galaxy S3 and predict what sort of activity the person is participating in. This is the kind of thing that is um, becoming really widely used now in a lot of uh, medical studies, but is also being used um, in other places as well to try to be able to determine what sort of things are, people are doing with their smartphones. So the first thing that we can do is we can start taking a look at some of the variables themse themselves. And so what we've done here is we first created um, a, a vector that is a numeric value for the different activities. So um, in this case, one is for standing, two is for sitting, three is for laying, four is for walking, five is for walking down, and six is for walking up. And then what I can do is I can take the data just for the first subject. So this data set actually contains um, data on multiple subjects, but we'll only be looking at the first subject here. And I can plot the first variable. So the first variable is the mean acceleration and the um, x-coordinate axis. And so then I can color it by the activity that the person was participating in. So you can see, for example, that um, when a person was uh, uh, laying or standing still, there wasn't much activity that was going on, whereas when they were walking down or walking up, their mean activity um, varied a lot more. You can also plot uh, that same variable for the y-axis. And so we actually have x, y, and z for each of these different measurements, but here's just a couple of them. So the next thing that we could do is we could um, actually just try to cluster the data based on the average acceleration and the x, y, and z coordinates. So what I've done here is I've created a, a distance matrix where I calculate um, for the first subject, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to look at all of their activities and look at the first three variables, the first three variables being the, uh, core, the measurements in the x, y, and z axis of the average acceleration. And what I'm going to do is say, you know, can we calculate the distance between those measurements, those acceleration measurements, between uh, all of the different activities that were performed by subject one, and then perform a hierarchical clustering like we uh, performed in the previous week's lecture. And if I plot that uh, clustering, I can see when I've colored it by activity that it actually doesn't cluster the activities very nicely. You can see that all of the sort of the different colors are mixed together so that they're not actually not very well um, distinguished. And you can actually kind of see why that, that would be true. You can see that 
despite there being some differences, say, between standing and walking, many of the activities have sort of similar patterns of variation across uh, this, uh, their activities that they're performing. So since clustering based on the mean acceleration in each of the axis directions didn't seem to bear too much fruit, we can actually take a look at some of the other variables in our data set. So the next set of variables that we might look at are the uh, max acceleration in each of the axis directions. And so what we've plotted here now are for the first subject, this is again all of the different uh, measurements that we take for that first subject, and they're color-coded by activity. And so you can see, say, for example, that the dark blue are the walking uh, activities and the light blue are they walking up, or sorry, walking down, and the pink are walking up. And so what you can see is that the max acceleration now distinguishes these activities substantially better than the uh, acceleration, the mean acceleration did. Um, you can see, for example, that standing and laying uh, have very low max acceleration, which isn't very surprising. Um, and that walking up and down and just any kind of walking actually has a much higher max acceleration. So based on these variables, you'd expect to see a little bit better clustering. And so we can actually perform a clustering, again, on just the activities of the very first subject. We can take the variables 10 through 12. Those are the max acceleration variables for those subjects and see how close those measurements are for um, different activities and perform a hierarchical clustering on them. And so what you actually end up seeing is that walking and walking up are still not very well distinguished, but walking down now gets kind of its own cluster over here on the left, the light blue points. So we've actually improved our clustering a little bit um, over using just the mean uh, acceleration. And we might want to ask ourselves, is there a way that we could actually start to distinguish out these other activities that weren't distinguished by the max acceleration on its own? So one way we could do that is we could uh, look at the singular value decomposition, which is something we also talked about last week. So what we can do is calculate the singular value decomposition on the uh, Samsung data. So again, this is the Samsung data where the activities for the first subject are in rows. And in the columns, we have all of the variables that have been collected with the accelerometer. And I've left out just um, the last two columns. And the reason why I've left those out is because one is the subject variable and one is the activity variable. So we're actually not interested in those. We want to just look at the Samsung data and see if what, uh, the patterns in those um, data can actually distinguish the activities. So when I calculate the singular value decomposition, I get, remember, three matrices. I get U, V, and D. And so U is the left singular vectors, and that's what I've plotted here. So I've plotted the, the first left singular vector, that's the first column of U, and the second left sing singular vector, that's the second column of U. So these uh, vectors show across, again, all of the different activities, what the most prevalent or the most common patterns that explain the most variation in the data set are. So we can see that the first singular vector uh, sort of not surprisingly distinguishes all the activities where you're sedentary, laying down or sitting or standing, from activities where you're doing something like walking, walking up, or walking down. And so this is uh, singular vector looks actually quite a bit like the max acceleration vector. And so it's maybe not necessarily helpful for us in improving our uh, analysis and our ability to cluster the, the differences between um, these categories here, the active categories. So if we look at the second singular vector, this is going to be uh, left singular vector. It's going to be orthogonal to the first left singular vector. Orthogonal in the sense that these two things are uncorrelated with each other. And so what we can see here now is actually that walking down and walking up, the uh, light blue and the uh, purple points are actually pretty well distinguished in this second left singular vector. So what we're seeing here is a pattern in the data that explains a lot of variation that actually separates out categories that weren't separated out by the uh, max. So the next thing that we want to know is, well, as we, you'll remember from the singular value decomposition lecture, this uh, left singular vector actually represents the average of potentially multiple patterns that are observed in the data set. So we want to actually go back and see if we can discover what are the variables that contribute to this pattern that we're observing here. So the way that we do that is we look at the right singular vector that corresponds to the left singular vector that gives that pattern. So again, we, we're looking at the second left singular vector. So now we look at the second right singular vector. So this is the V component of the SVD, and it's the second column of V. And we plot that. And so now this is actually, um, in the previous case, we were looking at um, the one subject across all their activities. 
Now what we're looking at is um, all the different variables. Um, so this is the variables 1 through 561 that were collected with the um, Samsung device. And what we're seeing here are the weights that um, each of these variables contribute to that pattern that is the second left singular vector. And so, for example, what we might want to do is pick out some of these variables that have a very high level of the weight. So that means that they're contributing a lot of, uh, of the variation to that pattern that we've observed in the left singular vector. So we might pick out, say, the one that's the maximum and include that variable when we do our clustering. So what I did is just that. I calculated what the max variable, uh, the max weight was for the uh, second right singular vector. So this is the variable that contributed the most to the second left singular vector's pattern, the one that distinguished walking up from walking down. Um, and then uh, I can actually recalculate the distance matrix. Now I'm using, again, uh, the variables 10 through 12. These are the uh, max acceleration variables. And then I'm also taking this max contributor variable, so the one that uh, contributes the most to that pattern of variation. And I reperform my clustering analysis. And so what I can see now is, uh, if you'll remember from uh, the previous slide, the, the first clustering with the max acceleration had the dark blue points and the pink points um, basically entirely intermixed. And now you can see that they've kind of been separated. And the reason why is that we picked out a variable using a sort of a, a multivariate technique. We identified a variable that was contributing to a major pattern in the data set that separated these activities out. So we're able to sort of start to identify the activities that distinguish the patterns of variation in uh, activity monitoring from these Samsung devices. The cool thing about these discovery techniques is that we can actually go back and see what variable that we've picked to include in our model and include in our clustering. And in this case, we're looking here at um, uh, the mean frequency uh, of changes in acceleration for the z variable. And it makes sense because what we've done is we've identified a variable that separates out walking from walking up uh, a set of stairs. And so you can imagine that there would be differences in the frequency of, of changes in the z axis if you would look, use that variable. And it's cool because we discovered that without having to know in advance what that variable is, we actually just saw it in the patterns and the data that best explain differences between the activities. So we can also apply k-means clustering to these data. And so I'm going to do this to sort of illustrate how k-means um, gives you a little bit different information and also behaves a little bit differently than the other clustering approaches. So what I've done here is I've applied the k-means clustering algorithm, algorithm to the Samsung data only again from the first subject. And again, I've eliminated the subject indicator and the activity indicator. So this uh, k-means clustering is being performed not on the activity data itself, only on the Samsung data that was collected about acceleration. And I've told k-means that I would like uh, six different clusters by telling it that there are six centers. And so then what I can do is I can actually make a table that says what cluster you were assigned to versus what activity that person was actually performing. So for example, for this first subject, we see that um, we cluster their activities into six different clusters. And the first cluster contains some of the time when the subject was laying, some of the time when, it was, when that subject was sitting, and some of the time when they were standing. Um, we can see that uh, cluster two and cluster five actually split up the walk down activities into two uh, separate clusters. Similarly, cluster 3 and cluster 4 actually uh, separate out uh, the walking activities. So this is important to note, uh, first of all, that even though we told k-means that there were uh, six clusters, and there actually are six clusters, it doesn't necessarily identify the clusters that we were thinking about in advance. It doesn't necessarily identify laying, sitting, and standing separately, because it's not clear that the variables that we've passed it will, per will perfectly cluster in that way. But also, as I mentioned in my earlier lectures, the k-means clustering algorithm is actually stochastic. It depends, it gives it a random start, and then the random start is updated and updated until you get the final centroids. And so I actually uh, only started it one time uh, because that's the default for k-means clustering here. So I can actually see what happens if I run it uh, the exact same algorithm again. And so I ran the exact same uh, command again. I gave it exactly one start. I get told it six centers. I passed it the exact same data, and I get a different set of clusters out. So you can see now uh, cluster one has uh, mostly uh, the walking uh, uh, variables, but also one walk down. Uh, 
you can see that um, walk is uh, separated out across clusters one through three. You can see, for example, that um, walk up uh, is primarily cluster four with a little bit of laying and sitting included. So again, you have a really hard time distinguishing laying, sitting, and standing. So those variables uh, get spread out, uh, or those uh, activities get spread out here in cluster six. But the important thing to note is if you look at where these uh, clusters land, they're very different than the first time I ran k-means clustering with only one start. So as I mentioned, there's one way that we could uh, try to address that, and that is instead of giving k-means uh, one opportunity to fit the algorithm, we actually give it 100 random starts and then do uh, sort of averaging to identify what cluster that you uh, end up in. So if I do that, now uh, I get yet another clustering from the k-means clustering algorithm. So in this clustering, uh, cluster 1 has mostly sitting and standing. Cluster 2 has mostly laying and sitting. Uh, cluster 3 is now uh, almost exclusively, is just exclusively walking. Uh, cluster 4 is mostly walk down. And uh, cluster six here is mostly walk up. So it looks like at least for these activities, we're doing a somewhat better job of separating those activities out once we've told k-means to try uh, to do this multiple times with the random restarts and average over those restarts. If I run it again with 100 starts, I do get something very slightly different. In particular, I might get the ordering of these labels differently. But uh, you can see it's pretty stable, All 49 um, uh, individual or 49 activity points got classified um, into cluster 2 that's for walk down and if you go to the previous slide you see it was cluster 4 in the previous slide but again it was the 49 um, activity points for walk down so the cluster names aren't necessarily stable but the uh, points get assigned much more stably to a specific cluster if I do uh, more random restarts so the cool thing about k-means clustering is that the, then you can go back and actually look at what each of these clusters means, or in other words, what are the variables uh, contributing to these clusters? What are the patterns that they look like? So we can actually look at the cluster one variable centers. And so this is the actually the first uh, cluster. This is the one that corresponds to mostly uh, uh, laying down activity. And these are the first 10 variables. So these three variables represent mean uh, acceleration, x, y, and z. Um, and then these variables here, the 10th variable, say, for example, uh, represents the uh, max acceleration in the x direction. And so you can see, for example, that for uh, laying, uh, a lot of the values are sort of very low. The acceleration values aren't uh, changing very much. The second uh, cluster is actually corresponding to the walk, mostly to walking. And for this cluster, you actually see that a lot of the acceleration values are actually quite a bit higher. So we can actually even look at which variables are higher for the walking center. And so we're able to actually kind of distinguish between different uh, clusters based on what their cluster centers look like. So that was a quick tour of the different clustering algorithms applied to the Samsung data. I've actually only looked at subject one for all of this analysis. But uh, an interesting thing to do is see if you can say cluster subjects together using hierarchical clustering or k-means clustering. And uh, I'd encourage you to take a try at that.